Good evening, my little darklings. Tonight, we examine a strange facet of the supernatural and the paranormal as we discuss haunted war tales. Some battlefields, such as Gettysburg, are known to be haunted. I personally have had my own experience there. Late at night, standing in the field in the dark with just two friends by my side, as we began to hear what sounded like distant fireworks going off, and suddenly the field in front of us was alive with crackling lights. At first I thought, are these fireflies? But no, there was something inherently different. And then came the noxious, overwhelming smell of gunpowder. Did we just witness a slip in time? Did we stand there where the blood was spilled, the fires were shot and people died, and actually get a glimpse into that moment? Very possibly. Wartime and haunted tales of battlefields is something that seems to intrigue many of us. Personally, for me, having had family that has fought in many of the different wars, I'm always fascinated by these stories, and I hope you will be too. We'll cover that next, right here on the very best in paranormal programming. I'm Dave Schrader, and this is my Paranormal 60. I'm not gonna stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Supernatural, perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. Hello, my little darklings. Just a little bit of housekeeping to take care of before we get launched into this evening's program. This Wednesday, the Paranormal 60 News crew has the night off because I am being joined by the one, the only, Neil Story. As we go spooky UK this Wednesday, hearing about some of the most unusual and paranormal hotspots throughout the UK. Neil Story, my special guest, that takes place this Wednesday. And if you'd like to go out with Neil and I this September and have a tour of some of these most haunted locations and get a chance to hear one-on-one -on -one from Neil Story about these locations, the history and the experiences he's seen and has been shared with him, then you're going to want to join us on our Erie England tour. That's Neil Story and myself, September 15th through the 25th. There are tickets that remain. You can get on and be part of this tour. Not only do you get to visit some of these haunted locations, but one of the stops along the way is a visit to the Festival of the Unexplained. This is going to be an amazing conference. It is the premier UK paranormal conference. I will be there. Cindy Kaza will be there. Shane Pittman will be there. Neil Story will be there. So we've got a plethora of fantastic speakers and many more that are being added. You'll get that as a part of the package with our tour. So if you want to get off the couch and get into the game and start to experience the paranormal and see these things for yourself, then I encourage you to check out the event that's coming up. You can get more information about that at darknessevents.com. So remember, this Wednesday, no news, but we do have Spooky UK with Neil Story coming up, and I hope you guys will enjoy that. Right now, let's take a look at our guest. R.C. Bramhall is a United States Army intelligence veteran, former Outward Bound lead instructor, juvenile probation officer, and a gifted and talented educator and consultant who has a master's in education from the Southern Methodist University and a BA in criminal justice from the University of West Florida. And even with those amazing credentials, somehow I was able to convince him to come on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us, RC. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, All right. You know, my first interview for the book. So I, I thank I you so much. I will be gentle, sir. I promise you. We do have a link for the book in today's program guide, so make sure you go check that out. Order the book, and as you've done for me, not only buy the book, but rate and review the book. It just takes you 30 seconds of time on Amazon, but that'll go a long way to help. The book is officially going to launch at the beginning of April, I believe. Is that right? Yes, April 2nd is the release date. But you can pre-order it right now, right and that's the link we have up and available. So go pre-order the book so as soon as it's ready to ship, you will be among the first to get Haunted War Tales. Uh, let's let's kind of dive into a little bit of the, your background on this, RC. Obviously, you've got some uh, interesting 
history of your very own, um, being in the United States Army and, and being a, an intelligence veteran. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your career in the military. And did you ever come across strange stories that were being reported by uh, enlisted people? For sure. So I, I was, uh, from the time I was little, it's kind of the first thing I knew I wanted to do was be a soldier. I uh, had an uncle, there's a Green Beret, so it was probably a big influence on me. But I uh, joined right out of high school, um, went into the intelligence corps, served in a various, uh, you know, positions, um, division level intelligence and what would be called like a SCIF, top secret facility. Um, was kind of an expert on the Soviet forces back then and the Warsaw Pact. And then hey, uh, out of curiosity, down. did that secret facility, did it rhyme with Shmeria 51? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> no, nothing that exciting going on there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, moved down to an uh, armored battalion and was like the uh, intelligence sergeant and uh, was deployed with an infantry battalion and then uh, followed up with some time in the National Guard with a special forces unit. I was in the military intelligence detachment for them. So I never encountered anything strange, but uh, there were always rumors. You know, there was always strange things going on and kind of like, I'm sure you're familiar with the men who stare with, at goats in the movie, right. some of the books associated with that. You know, there were some rumors. I was never um, part of that, but I had heard some stories about that stuff and was always kind of interested. So, Well, when you examine the fact that there are so many different sites around the United States that were at one point maybe strongholds during wars, uh, battlefields where bodies were left discarded and, you know, just left to literally rot into the, the soil because there just wasn't the manpower to do anything with them. Right. It, it's not really a surprise to think that some of these locations might be haunted. Even the Presidio in San Francisco, uh, you know, an active base still has weird things going on. When we got a chance to visit that boy, 10, 12 years ago, a lot of the different uh, former employees and, and um, people on staff were still willing to kind of talk about it, but under the table kind of thing. It was like, hey, I, I can't officially go on record, but yes, this happens all the time. Everything from footsteps to seeing what looks like an entire group of soldiers rounding a corner and vanishing before their eyes. So there are a lot of these locations that seem so active even this many years later, is that a surprise to you to, to have these kind of places, you know, maybe separated by 100, 200 years from wartime and, and when a lot of this bloodshed and battle took place, to see that there's still echoes of the past crying out? For sure. I'm, a, I'm kind of a big believer in that theory that, uh, I'm a, you know, a lot of hauntings might actually be an energy imprint. You know, I feel like anywhere where there's so much emotion expended, um, sudden death, you know, unexpected death. Um, I feel like it's almost impossible that that isn't, you know, kind of absorbed into the geography of the area. Right. And um, that it's it's there and kind of playing on a loop. And I think sometimes we, you know, somehow perceive that that loop that's kind of occurring over and over again. Um, but yeah, you know, my last chapter, I kind of go around the nation. I went from the West coast to the East coast, North, South, even up to Alaska and kind of picked different bases and looked at the local lore and, you know, the legends and things that are associated with those bases. And, uh, Fort Leavenworth is probably the most haunted base. Um, so many hauntings there. It's pretty amazing. Now, when you say so many hauntings, like, I mean, what, what type of activity are we talking about? A lot of, um, you know, soldiers, it used to be, uh, of course, you know, like Leavenworth is the uh, military prison. Mm -hmm. um, going way back, uh, it was a POW, German POWs were kept there. And uh, a bunch of them were actually executed there. There were so many, it was like the last um, mass execution in like the army history, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the mass number that they hung they actually ran out of gallows room and hung a few from the elevator shaft. Holy so, cow. Yeah. That's a pretty wild story to think a Nazi ghost in Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> something you wouldn't expect, right? No, um, not at all. Uh, Custer's ghost is seen there. It's where his court martial occurred. His brother is buried there. Um, 
various soldiers that committed suicide. Um, a, a actual a wife of a soldier whose children disappeared and she searched for them and she passed away from pneumonia. Um, lots of lots of really cool stories at Leavenworth. And that's just one example. I, I'm just curious, you know, having had the career that you've had, at what point did the paranormal start to trickle into your consciousness that you thought, there's enough meat on this bone, I might need to write a book about it? For sure. Uh, well, I've always, you know, for some reason, like the mashup of Horror and War. And uh, mm -hmm. I was a struggling screenwriter for several years. And that was kind of always my genre. It was kind of like mashing those two, those two subjects together. Um, when I go back to my childhood, I think about, do you remember like the old DC comics? Uh, they actually had a, a one called Weird War. Right. And it was like collections of stories that always, you know, it was some war setting, uh, all time periods, always mashed up with horror. Man, I love that comic book, right? Yeah. And then uh, GI Combat was the other one, Haunted War, uh, the Haunted Tank. Mm -hmm. It was a tank haunted by the ghost of Jeb Stewart, right? Um, so, you know, from a very early age, just that subject seemed to appeal to me. Always have collected those stories. And I, at a certain point, uh, it's actually like COVID year. I realized, you know, I had collected enough of these and started to see that there's enough to kind of classify into different areas. And I might have enough to put a book together. And then my goal also was so much of this stuff is scattered everywhere. Right. You, know, you have to look really hard to find it. It's so obscure. So, you know, just kind of collecting all those, curating them and uh, collecting all this new stuff from Iraq and Afghanistan that nobody really has yet either. Mm -hmm. Those are the things I was most excited about for sure. We've we've talked on the show quite a bit about uh, these beings like the, the black eyed children. Yeah. And I was surprised to start hearing from uh, former military personnel that had been in Iraq and Afghanistan that claimed to have encountered these children, these beings. And they weren't just it wasn't a racist comment of some dark skinned kid with black eyes. It legitimately, right. they said these kids would appear out of nowhere. Their eyes were jet black. Sometimes they would try to get the soldiers to come with them or try to persuade the soldiers to go to an area that would then become very volatile. And it was surprising to me to hear them talk about this. So matter of factly, but yet with this, I don't even know how to put it into the right terms. They were so basic, like just the facts, but you could see that it was so perplexing to them that they know that there was something supernatural to this. And that fits outside the paradigm of what the military taught them to look at and see things as. For sure. There's um, actually uh, one of the stories is a, a reporter was in the airport, like uh, leaving Iraq and was stopped by a soldier and kind of told him this crazy story that's similar to the, black eyed children, um, you know, and it's kind of the same thing, just kind of matter of factly told the story, like it was something that he had just witnessed and that it wasn't, you know, that shocking. Um, and one of the things you find, especially in Iraq, um, is a belief in a lot of the spirit world. A lot of the, you know, uh, a lot of our soldiers had encounters with what we might possibly classify as jinn, you know, mm -hmm. the genies, some interesting stuff there. Um, and then, you know, one of the patterns you see too, like a lot of uh, figures seen out in the de in the desert, spotted through their night vision goggles. They can see them with their naked eye or with their night vision goggles. And they put thermals on them; doesn't register. There's nothing there. Um, seemed to be a pattern that a lot of the guys like saw in different locations. Those kind of entities, strange stuff. Now, do you believe? I mean, having been former intelligence. Uh, do you believe that these are supernatural beings or are they cloaking devices that do exist that we're just not quite privy to yet? Yeah. I mean, there's so many factors involved, right? Even just, and I go into that, just the idea of a lot of our soldiers, you know, you're, you're a lack of sleep. You've been awake for days. Um, mm -hmm. You're tired. You might be hungry. Um, it's, you know, it's easy for things to get misconstrued. And I even talk about that, how our mind can play tricks with, you know, on us and, how when you get a pre preconceived notion sometimes, you know, that simple things become monsters when really they're not. Um, so, you know, some of those things definitely factor in, but I, I mean, I believe people when people say that they see things and that they're hundred percent sure about it, you know, there has to be something to it. And when we look at the, at the spirit world and ghost, for me, it passes the litmus test 
you know, anything that kind of crosses religious beliefs, cultural beliefs, you know, time spans mm-hmm. and, and ghosts have been something that have been with us since the dawn of time, regardless right. of all those things. So to me, there has to be something to it. People have to be seeing something. It's, you know, it's, it's telling when you talk to the battlefield people. And as you said, I, I love that you take an approach in your book that you're, you're open to these stories. You explore the stories, but you also give, you hold up the mirror of, of reality to some of these elements. Like my sons served in the military and had to go through unbelievable training for the positions that they held. Some of these survival training courses, they are literally not eating anything. They're there to live off the land for four or five days. For and sure. uh, they are seeing things and hearing things. And the uh, squad leaders um, are, are used to this with the, the cadets or with the, I don't know what the proper terminology is, but with them knowing what to do and manipulating them to react or overreact to certain elements that they can judge them on how well they can hold things together and everything. So yeah, having spoken to my sons about this, spoken to some of the other young men that I know and young ladies that have gone through these training, some of them have sworn to God that during training, they saw what they consider to be interdimensional beings or shadow figures that would lead them to safety during this um, like war game scenario and help navigate them at points when they felt so broken and tired and exhausted, like they couldn't go on. These things would kind of goad them on and help them through and they couldn't explain it. And part of it is rationally you want to say, well, you're, you know your position, you know what you're doing, you're you're sleep deprived, you're food deprived, you might be hallucinating, this might be a projection from within you to try to keep you on task, but it's interesting when multiple members of the team witness the same exactly yeah. help them. For sure, and that, you know, that's a common theme. Uh, I haven't touched on that in the book, uh, a little section about the gremlins. We mm-hmm. talk about Charles Lindbergh, and he had an experience like that whenever he was flying his famous flight around the world where some entities kind of like came into the uh, cockpit with him and helped him guide through a difficult time in his flight. Right. Um, so, there, you know, that's a strange phenomenon. Is it just our subconscious, you know, that's helping us in, in those times of need? Or is it something that, that comes along like our, our guardian angel? Yeah, that's I, every aspect of that is is fascinating to me. And I know having a grandfather who served in World War II, he would tell me many of his stories and things that he saw and witnessed. And you could see the deep impact and effect that he carried for his entire life having seen that. But he also was very cognizant of the fact that something was with him. Something helped him through. Um, you know, we were at, at a moose lodge at one point in like the late eighties playing oh, slot moose. machines. Yeah. Playing slot machines my there in Louisiana, <laughs> Louisiana and, and uh, my grandfather just kept losing. I go, doesn't it piss you off that you keep losing? And he goes, I survived world war two. I kind of feel like I used up all the luck I had there and I'm okay with that. If I got to put 20 bucks in and lose once in a while, I'll take that exchange. And really? I always thought that was a, a brilliant way to do it. But the things and and there were points and we weren't very open about the supernatural in that part of my life with my grandfather. And I wish I would have pushed and asked questions more along that lines. Um, I was that way with my mom and aunt, his, his daughters, but never really spoke to him openly about it. And I often wonder what he saw. And, and I did get the impression that he believed he was um, being helped considerably in a few of these experiences. I mean, he tumbled out of a plane as a paratrooper and his parachute did not go off and he ended up just falling and breaking a leg. Wow. Yeah. That tells you something was watching out for him. Right. Um, Yeah. Just it's, it's really kind of remarkable. Now let's go back into this. As you started researching and doing some of this, obviously Gettysburg comes to mind and I'm going to be in Gettysburg later this year for the Gettysburg battle bash, which is a big awesome. fun event that they do to help raise money for um, wounded warriors project and uh, terminally ill children. So it's a great event and it's got a lot of paranormal personalities. that will be out there again. You can find information at darknessevents.com, and that's going to be in June. So I encourage you to come on out and hang out with us. It's super affordable and a lot of fun, awesome. big party weekend and a lot of cool stuff, but I've been to Gettysburg, man. I've seen things firsthand 
and have been there on the battlefield watching as I started off the show. Yeah, I love watching your intro. What looked like a battle, silent battle taking place directly around us, but it sounded like it sounded like firecrackers off in the distance, but there were lights popping, like little flash bulbs clipping. And it was not, it was not lightning bugs. I grew up with lightning bugs. This was like cracks coming from a, a, a musket or a gun. Right. Uh so unusual, but it's not. People have these experiences. Yeah, so all many people, time. right? At Gettysburg, it's so common. And uh it, you know, as I share in my book, it, it almost seemed contrived. Uh, what happened to me there? Um, and it, uh, I can relate it real quickly if you, if you like. Of course, that's why yeah. you're here. So, you know, the East Calvary field, if you're familiar with that, is kind of mm -hmm. a more remote part of the battlefield. Right. It's separated kind of across the Hanover Road. And it's where uh, Jeb Stewart clashed with George Armstrong Custer. Mm. Um, so, you know, I love horse cavalry. It's my favorite kind of uh, military history always love those kind of, you know, the cavalry generals for some reason. But um, I had gone out there and it was early morning and it was on a weekday. And like I said, it's kind of a neglected part of the battlefield. And I realized I was there by myself. Like literally the park was empty and I was the first one in there. So I was kind of cruising around and stopping at different monuments and checking things out. And um, you know how Gettysburg is, the, the landscape is still exactly the way it was you know it's right. one of those remarkable places where you don't have to use your imagination you can kind of see the way the battle happened um so i'd stopped at one of the major points of the battle and kind of you know was sitting in my car for quite a while the car was off it was in park it was on level ground and was just kind of sitting there thinking about the battle and ruminating on things and i was you know the car was pushed forward like so hard that I moved in my seat and like moved and actually turned around thinking somebody had pulled in and tapped me. Right. You know, which was strange because there was no one else around. Like why'd they pull that close to me? Right. Nothing was there. <laughs> so, you know, kind of like, okay. And moved on down and uh, went to the cornfield where the charge had occurred and got out and checked that out and kind of my, my military nerd self, I yelled out, you know, come on, you Wolverines, like Custer's battle cry. Kind of expected something to happen, but nothing did. But went on down, and the last place I stopped was where the Union artillery was. And I'd been taking photographs the whole way through. And the last photograph I took there, hours later when I looked back through, um, which I included in the book, and I, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully you got a chance to look I at did. it. Yeah. And you can see a strange, you know, <laughs> outline of what looks like a person in that photo in that weird energy bar. Um, so like, again, almost contrived. And I've been to Gettysburg so many times before that and nothing like that had ever happened. But um, yeah, made, made me wonder if I was really alone out there that day. I, you know, I get asked to look at a lot of paranormal photographs from people all around the world. And I've uh, been in Gettysburg a few times and, you know, it gets kind of cringy at some moments because I hate letting people down when they show me a picture that I, you know, think is a bug right. or a, a drop of moisture or something. And this one guy was telling me, oh, this elaborate story and how they heard the thundering sound of hoofbeats as they were sitting in their car just looking at one of the monuments. And he goes, so I just took a picture. And he goes, and I caught a picture of a, a soldier on horseback. And I'm wow. like, yeah, you did. And he showed me the picture. And he caught a picture of a soldier on horseback. It's a blue, wispy smoke, but it is a soldier and you see the horse. I mean, it was one of the most remarkable Unreal. pictures I'd seen. And then I was like, all right, but did, you know, am I being hoodwinked here? Is this this really good, um, you know, Photoshop? And uh, I went back a couple of years later and I had somebody come up and start talking to me about having visited this specific area again. And I don't want to say where it is because I want people, if they have their own experiences, to not, um, you know, start layering it on there or tell me how they had the same thing happen. I'd rather right. they tell me where they had it happen and I can verify for them but uh another one almost identical picture but you see what looks like its arm stretched out in front as though it was in the middle of a charge and i can't, i understand you know uh pareidolia and thinking you see things in this but this was so remarkably this translucent horse and rider that i cannot wrap my head around it and there's been a lot of interesting footage 
What do you make of those pieces of footage that have come out showing what, you know, they've got some of those cannons by the sides of the road uh, or off in the battlefield and you see what appears to be a soldier get up in between them and run. And there's multiple pieces of footage like that that exist. Where, where do you stand on that, RC? I mean, I, you know, there's too much for it to be hoaxes every time, right? I'm sure, if, you know, I'm sure a few of them are just like anything else, but there's just too much that happens there for it to be something that's not legitimate. And again, gonna, you know, when you're talking about one of the most important battles in American history, right? Where so many people died with so much emotion involved, you know, it's got to be one of those places. And literally family member against family member yeah. in some instances that you're just you know what a brutal brutal savage time so it's understandable why these grounds that were soaked in blood would still maintain the haunting because it's almost like the ground wants us to remember right For that sure. the, that the spirit yeah. and the earth and time and history demand to be remembered that uh you know jumping across overseas because we all know gettysburg mm -hmm. but uh one of the most remarkable stories kind of a highlight of the book i think is op rock in Afghanistan. Um, All right, well, let's, let's take a break okay. and we'll come back and pick up with that when we can. R.C. Bram, all our guest, his book, Haunted War Tales, True Military Encounters with the Bizarre, Paranormal, and Unexplained, will be out in the beginning of April, but you can pre-order that book now and we have a link for it in today's program guide. So go check that out. We'll be back with more right after this. Hey, my friends, you're looking for answers. You're looking for insights and you want some help, but don't know exactly where to go. Check out Love and Lotus Tarot. Winnie Schrader can help guide you through these questions in life with the help of the spirits and the cards revealing what you need to know. You can book virtual appointments with Winnie or find out where she's going to be so that you can book appointments with her when she's on site. All you have to do if you're watching is scan that QRC code that you see on the screen or just go to paranormal60.com, that's paranormal60.com, and click on the Love and Lotus Tarot tab at the top of the page. You'll be glad you did. Go check it out. Love and Lotus Tarot. The cards are waiting to tell your story. Are you ready to listen? All right, we are back. Our guest tonight, R.C. Bramhall, his book, is out and available, Haunted War Tales, True Military Encounters with the Bizarre, Paranormal, and Unexplained. It is out and available for you to pre-order right now. It officially hits stores in April, and uh, you can pre-order the book through the links that are on tonight's program guide. I'm going to also kind of keep an eye on uh, the questions from the audience. So if you have a specific question for our guest, feel free to uh, ask it, and I will try to put them up during and after the stories here. All right, so just before the break, you were telling me about what you think is one of the premier tales uh, of the supernatural that you cover, and this goes back to Afghanistan. So please, RC, you have the floor. Yeah, and it's uh, one of the uh, things I'm proud about because, you know, you, this story's been put out there in different places. You can kind of find it on the internet. There's been a couple of TV documentaries made about it, um, but nobody really put all the pieces together. And what's amazing about this place is it goes all the way back to possibly like Alexander the Great, this location. It's kind of a small little elevated mound, but it oversees this valley and kind of, you know, it's the high ground in this area. So it's always been strategic importance. Um, coupled with that, there's an ancient Muslim shrine there that's considered to be, you know, very spiritual. So the whole area has this kind of vibe to it already. Um, during the 80s, when the Soviets and the Mujahideen were fighting, um, 40 Afghan policemen were executed on this mound, basically mm. mass buried there. About two years later, the Soviets attacked and uh, a lot of strange stuff happened. They, they dropped bombs on the, on the town um, and one of the bombs actually hit the shrine and didn't detonate you know, adding to the mystique of the area, right? Wow. Um, so the Afghans defeated the Soviets in this battle and took the Soviet dead and added it to the to the mass burial. So there's all these bodies there, right? So we come along in uh, 2000. Um, the Taliban had taken it over. We dropped a bomb on the Taliban, so added some more bodies there. 
And now, um, let's see, what year was it? 2008, the Marines move in and set up a patrol base nearby. So this observation point, OP Rock, is set up at this location. Basically, strange things start to happen. The locals told them, hey, this is a bad spot. You don't want to be there. And whatever you do, don't dig. And if you dig, put it back. So these guys um, started to have some weird things happen, but not too much. Um, they collapsed some of the tunnels that were inside this thing. The British took over, and I found some reports from like British sources talking about while the Brits were there that they experienced all this bizarre stuff. Um, so the Marines, our Marines, came back and take it over from the Brits again, and the Brits basically, you know, tell them kind of the same thing: like, don't dig anything up, and if you do. Put it back and leave it alone. So what's the first thing the Marines do? As any infantryman knows, you, you dig in deeper, right? Got to right. get digger, dig those foxholes, dig those trenches. So pretty soon they realized as they started finding bones and more skulls and that they were on top of a mass burial site. Ooh. And after that's when all the crazy stuff really started to happen. And kind of what you were talking about, you know, it's it's rare when you get an entire squad of eight men who all claim these things happen. And I won't get I won't tell everything, but basically the haunting got progressively worse as they were there to the point where it got pretty insane near the end. And, um, you know, it's just, again, one of those spots we're talking about. Uh, it's probably going to be forever haunted. Um, so much violence has occurred there uh, that it, it's one of those places that's going to hold that dark energy, I think, forever. Yeah, that's um, that's uh, it. It strikes on so many different chords again, right? The concept of religious beliefs in the area that you're in, and you're disturbing some of these sites and places. Which, of course, our military is not trying to upset those apple carts, um, but needing a place to hunker down and be safe. You, you don't always know. It's not like some of these places are well mapped and no. uh, you know yield burial dump, right? I mean, there's no no sign there to let you know what you're running into. But the fact that even the deserts have stories that refuse to to die, right? And you want to, uh, you know, these spirits that might not have even been truly part of a wartime effort, but that have been buried there for whatever purpose, religious conviction or whatever, to, you know, have, have lost their lives and still be there. And and now a, an entire platoon comes in there and starts mucking about and, and having these experiences. Were the... Were the soldiers impacted by this? Did they ever come open? Were you able to get any information about whether they, you know, how that affected or impacted any of them to see these things happen? Yeah, for sure. One of them actually, uh, after an event had occurred to him there, actually like asked for a, a, you know, a transfer from the unit and was faced with, you know, a lot of um, bad feelings from the rest of the guys because they felt like he was, kind of leaving them and using this paranormal you know thing as an excuse to get out of there but quickly after he left it started to happen to the other guys too and they realized you know that they had been making fun of him for being silly and crazy and started to experience a lot of the same things hmm. interesting we've got some uh, questions from the audience christina says rc what have you learned about the gin it seems like they are more dangerous than just your standard entity yeah, what's That's so cool about the Jinn is, yep. you know, they're, uh, they're considered an actual, like, separate entity. Okay? So, like, you know, they exist in a different plane, basically. And they're not necessarily evil. They're kind of, like, neutral. They can be mischievous, but they can be called upon to do things for you. So, during the war, there were even rumors of some extremist Muslim groups who actually practiced, you know, like kind of like black magic and trying to summon the type of jinn that would attack strangers or foreigners in their land. Um, but yeah, the couple instances where, you know, uh, one time our guys shot at a guy and it seemed like he dissolved into black smoke. And several guys witnessed that. Another wow. guy um, saw a strange man walking up the side of a building, kind of turned around and went back and the guy was on the ground, just kind of looking at him with his arms crossed. Holy cow. Just strange things like that, you know, uh, just really unexplainable stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Uh, Cosmic Joe says, is there any ghost stories about Abraham Lincoln that you were able to uh, find? 
Well, there's lots about Abraham Lincoln, but honestly, I, I tried to shy away from a lot of the stuff that's already out there. I really mm -hmm. wanted this book to be kind of new things that, you know, you haven't come across before. Um, so a lot of those most common type of um, hauntings and stories, I really did avoid. And that's also why I didn't get into aliens or UFOs, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you're a Bigfoot person, you're going to love this book, too. And especially yeah. because, uh, you know, international wild man sightings from the Russian military, from the Chinese, from the Japanese in World War II. Um, you know, to really get people who don't understand that, that this is a worldwide phenomenon mm -hmm. and that there's a lot of evidence that these things were pushed into these remote, uninhabitable regions. And when we're at war, that's some of the only times we go into places like that. And then you couple it with when we go into those places, we're using cutting edge technology to look at them in ways, you know, they've never been so closely examined. And who knows, you know, we, we find these things, lots of stories in Afghanistan from our guys seeing, you know, what, what, what are called in that region, the Almas, um, or in Afghanistan, they're known as the, uh, what are they called there? The uh, Batut. Okay. So they have their own names, you know, regionally for these things also. I've got uh, a couple more popping up here. Uh, Addy says, uh, RC, what was your creepiest encounter? Um, my own creepiest encounter. I don't know if I've had one, honestly. Um, the creepiest story in the book to me was actually told by a friend, which made it even more personal. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a world war two story. And, uh, it's about basically, uh, a paratrooper who, it was impossible that he could be alive that continued to talk to him through the night. And like when he realized in the morning, this guy's neck had been broken and that there was no way he could have been talking to him. Um, it just chilled him to the bone. He never shared it with anyone before. So I felt kind of honored that he did share it with me before he passed away. Uh, and I'm looking here, I'm trying to keep up with the questions, folks. Sorry. I know you get a lot of great comments and, a lot of compliments to the stories that you've uh, shared and the insights that you're giving. So they're thanking awesome. you for that. Uh, let me. Use this. I'm going to scroll up again, folks. If you have any direct questions, please put them in. I'll do my best uh, to put them up on the screen again as we continue on. And the whole um, thing is, like I honestly wrote this. If you're a military historian, you love it. You mm -hmm. learn a lot. You know, I try to make it as educational as possible. Also, um, if you're a skeptic, you're going to like it. I debunk a few things where I can. Um, if you're a believer, you're going to love it. Right. Um, so I really did try to make an entertaining book that no matter who you are, you're going to find something entertaining from it and really enjoy it. <clears throat> Sandra Kincaid says, thanks for having this guest on. I work in Gettysburg. Happy Monday, everybody. Thank you for the love and support okay. as well. Sandra Kincaid. Uh, yeah. Gettysburg is no joke. Uh, I know, um, what is it? Williamsburg, another place that's pretty popular, uh, that has a lot of weird, uh, paranormal yeah, in Virginia instances. Um, you know, going out to Hawaii, standing above the USS Arizona, it had a deep impact on me and a, and a handful of other men that were standing there. Uh, legitimately, I did not feel alone and I was overwhelmed with emotions. And it was almost simultaneously that I began to sob openly as well as five did other guys, you know, five other guys. I did not know. None of us were there sure. together. None of us knew, but it was just this, overwhelming sense of sadness and and loss that you can it, you can legitimately feel all these years later over a tragic site like this definitely yeah i feel Did those you, same emotions when i go to those places do you you know obviously you didn't want to hit on all the places that are, are most well known or have been talked about ad nauseum but i am curious because you do take a skeptical look at some of the cases and stories as well were there some of the more high profile stories that you looked at that just really didn't seem to add up to the hype after you, you really kind of pulled apart the story and the experiences. Well, um, definitely the one that comes to mind is, uh, there's, you know, a lot of internet kind of stories about giants in Afghanistan or, um, the government search for the tomb of Nimrod, right. Get, who, mm -hmm. Who's also known as Gilgamesh. From right. The Bible, right. Nimrod. Um, and it's, it's really interesting how that story was 
was built from taking photographs from various locations and different settings and times, putting them together and making a pretty convincing story from uh, soldiers going up the stairs of a, an ancient ziggurat in Iraq to pictures of gold treasure and like all kind of artifacts being looked at at our guys in uniform um, to a mysterious email uh, that was supposedly uncovered during the Hillary Clinton uh, shakedown right? okay. that uh, involved a request for the resurrection chamber of Gilgamesh, the location of it in Iraq. <laughs> so really? all this stuff put together, yeah, yeah, check it out. Um, you know, all this stuff put together makes a pretty wild conspiracy story that our government was searching for the tomb of Gilgamesh, you know, to find this mysterious resurrection chamber and all the secrets of the ancient race of giants, right? Um, but it's pretty easy to debunk. When you when you look at these photographs, there's nothing um, mysterious about them. Mm -hmm. That ziggurat was actually within one of our bases when we were in Iraq. So our guys kind of used to go there on tour. Um, the, uh, you know, the treasure that they found was actually from a different location. It was from the tomb of Nimrud. So the name was, you know, kind of mis misinterpreted right. in a different way. And then that email, really what all it amounts to is that somebody just requested from the State Department if there was any information. So it doesn't even have to be a government employee. It could have been you or me. Like if we requested that year for the location of Sasquatch bodies in Area 51, right? Mm -hmm. We would turn up on a search if someone searched for those terms on a government email. We, you know, we would, we would turn up on their request. So that's really all it was. And, and you know, it's just a lesson for all, a lot of people that fall into that trap of just believing things that they see, uh, that there, there's usually a story behind it and there's usually a, a, a story to be debunked, right? Right. Uh, Donna C says, my favorite military haunted spots are Saratoga Battlefield, Arlington Cemetery, Fort William uh, Henry. I had a friend of mine, a neighbor, a uh, former neighbor of mine who served and was a century outside of the tomb of the unknown soldier, soldier. at Arlington. And uh, he remembers distinctly his first night being there. There were two of them stationed, and they were specifically told not to leave their post no matter what, you know, given a set of rules and, and circumstance. And they said, and when the general appears, you salute. And they're like, oh, okay, so I guess generals stop by to say hi or whatever. And he said, no, it wasn't a human general in the sense of, you know, flesh and blood, physical form. He goes, it was late at night, maybe one o'clock, one or two in the morning. And this being came misty out of the, you know, area and just walked right up the stairs. And he goes, and we both slowly <laughs> saluted. He nodded and walked into the tomb. And he said, and we saw things like this constantly at Arlington Cemetery. Yeah, I've heard a lot of reports of like, you know, the, the typical glowing orbs. Mm -hmm. Moving amongst the, the headstones, lots of that for sure. Salt and Pepper wants to know, uh, RC, do you see a second book in your future? I'd love to read them. Definitely. That's the, that's the hope is uh, that people will send me more stories. And I actually have a, an email in the book for people to send their own to me. If I collect right, enough so, of them, definitely. But, so if people right now, let's just gather them up. If there are people that are interested and served in the military and have military stories of their own or visited these battlefields or historic sites and had experiences, what's the best way to reach you, RC? Um, it is called weird war sit rep at gmail.com. Weird okay. war sit rep. Weird war sit rep at gmail.com. Yep. S I T R E P sit rep. All right. Very cool. All right. Uh, let's do this. Let's take our final break. We'll come back. We'll uh, have more to discuss. Great conversation this evening. And again, the book is called Haunted War Time or Haunted War Tales. It is true military encounters with bizarre, paranormal, and the unexplained. R.C. Bramhall, our guest, a link for that book on today's program guide. Go check it out. In winter's grasp, a chilling tale unfolds. Wanted Magazine's issue 40. Secrets to be told. Al Capone's ghost in shadows it creeps. A spectral mobster where darkness seeps. Fourteen signs of a poltergeist's might. 
haunting whispers in the silent night. Pascagoula UFO, 50 years gone by. A cosmic encounter reaching the sky. The ghost train of Tate Bridge echoes in the mist. A phantom journey where souls exist. Wanted Magazine Issue 40 is out now. Available from selected outlets and bit.ly forward slash haunted magazine. Don't be normal, be paranormal. We are back. R.C. Bramhall, our guest this evening as we talk about haunted war tales. Uh, I wish, yeah, thank you. Uh, I wish we... uh, had just unlimited time, and I'd love to get you back on the show no again doubt. in the future. And maybe we'll uh, encourage some of our listeners. You can always send your stories to me, Dave at paranormal60.com. I will forward them over to RC if you forgot uh, the address, yes, having any trouble communicating with them. But uh, yeah, maybe we can pull some of the stories that audience members send in. We'll have you back on, and we can share some stories and hear what you have to say about uh, some of the tales. That have come out. What what place in your research surprised you most for the kind of activity and the amount of activity that took place? What place? Hmm. Um, you know, uh, Abu Ghraib prison. Okay. The famous prison, right? Saddam Hussein's right. famous prison, where unfortunately uh, some of the war crimes committed by our military police there is what's remembered the most. Mm-hmm. Um, but man. The stories from there and just the soldiers that served there, it's almost like uh, they describe it, you know, it was like the shining meets apocalypse now. Really? And just, yeah. And it, it the, the amount of murders that happened there, once again, you know, just a, a place just absorbed with dark energy. And the soldiers that served there, it almost seems like uh, a lot of them feel like, you know, that's what happened. Like it changed them and started to make them into dark people. And um, what's wild about it is just through my research and looking at local Iraq newspapers, the neighborhood to this day is still considered haunted. They can't sell homes in the neighborhood. And people who live there claim that like at night, you know, there's ghosts that knock on the door and there's screams through the night. And people that live there just kind of become like depressed and, you know, downcast looking and it's it's a wild wild story. I uh, and I like the the way the audience is uh, perceiving tonight's show as well. Music says this is an excellent episode. So much scary beep. So <laughs> I agree. Uh, very weird stuff. Uh, there are a lot of the military bases where the uh, military housing is haunted. Like yeah, and, and I I have run into people left and right at events who've come up to tell me, yeah, we were stuck on site for years and i was begging my husband or begging my wife to get us off base because our place was so insanely haunted that none of us slept well we were having trouble and when we would complain he's like listen who do i go to to talk about this if i go to my commanding officer and tell them we can't sleep at night because we have ghosts they're gonna boot me out of the military i'm gonna lose everything that we've worked so hard for and she's like, but it's tearing us apart. It's and he's like, I know, but I can't do anything about that. It's interesting because to me, how do they not know? Unless it is that people are just so shut up about it because they're afraid of how it will look. Um, you know, we're, we're lifting the veil now. And if you're in the military and witness UFO, UAP, you are now allowed to talk about it and share it openly and not have uh, issues. Do you ever think there will be an open door policy where it comes to the paranormal as well, where they can go in and explain what is going on, what they're seeing and, and experiencing and not have to worry about it ending their career? I definitely think it's getting better, right? Because there was years ago, you couldn't. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the interesting things I came across were like military policemen out at uh, uh, Fort Edwards military base in California. Okay. Um at one of their reunions, you know, talking about all the insane spooky stuff that used to happen to them there. Um, you know, so like years later, a lot of times these guys are more open to talk about it when they're not at risk, they're retired. I uncovered, uh, one of the proudest things I I have in the book, 
uh, are the phenomenon of rock apes in Vietnam. Because a lot of the guys now that wouldn't talk about them before, now that they're a lot older, they're not as afraid to, you know, be honest about what they experienced. So I think there will be more of that. It's more acceptable. We did uh, an episode last year uh, about the red lens or red light demons that yeah. were being witnessed in Vietnam. Um, and it was a special uh, goggles that were given to some of the aviators and helicopter pilots, uh, gunners, and they were seeing things jumping and flying between trees. And they ended up having to get rid of these goggles and yeah. replace them because they were blowing up expensive um, uh, ammunition, trying to kill things that nobody else could see. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with that? The, the red light? Uh, yeah, and even uh, some of our newest, newer technology guys experience the same kind of stuff when they look up at the sky. And they'll see all kind of crazy stuff going on and then look with the naked eye and there's nothing there. <laughs> yeah. I know when I was standing at uh, Trout Lake, Washington, um, I was looking up in the sky and I saw one little pinpoint of light moving and I'm like, that's interesting. And I grabbed the, the military grade night vision goggles and I looked up and when I looked up, it was a huge triangle, huge. And I'm like, why am I not seeing it with the naked eye? It's like, it's right above us. All I see is the tip light that's moving over us, silent, but there it is. This wow. giant triangle just cruising over the property as we're all standing there watching the sky. And then I'm thinking, but I'm looking at it and I see the stars. I see this light moving through the stars. How is this thing that huge through night vision that it's blocking out the stars through night vision? again just yeah, totally absolutely. bizarre yeah. yeah and imagine if you start digging into the ufo elements and aspects uh you should have about eight more volumes of books exactly. that'll be coming out <laughs> yeah was it hard to try to keep it to just these kind of stories and and not leap i mean obviously you cover some monsters and strange beings um it, made it, it definitely it, made it a little more difficult to find enough material right? but that's what kind of also made it fun was finding all this obscure stuff um, you know, about things that I've never heard about before. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, stay after the show for a few minutes after we say yeah. good night to everybody. And I'll, I'll talk to you on a few things that I'll uh, throw, throw in your direction that might help you with uh, the next book as well. Awesome. Um, that. yeah. And, uh, good stuff for the people that are not familiar. And I, I need to just a little touch here again, rock apes. Talk to us about the rock apes. Yeah. So the rock apes are, you know, another hairy hominid. Um, and again, what's interesting, the, the history of the things go all the way back. The indigenous tribes there have always kind of known they were around. French explorers in the 1800s had a few encounters with them. And then in Vietnam, again, one of the first times that some of these areas have been explored. You know, mm -hmm. our guys were the first ones in there outside of the indigenous tribes in some of the highlands. And, um, started seeing these things and the, the way that they were different, they were a lot shorter, maybe four or five feet, but they were bipedal, walked on two legs. They call them rock apes because they had the habit of throwing rocks at our soldiers. They'd get aggravated by them and kind of didn't show much fear of humans and would uh, even like kind of in mass attack our guys at times. But I found so many reports of these that it's hard to ignore. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to ignore um a lot of legitimate reportings from a lot of different kinds of guys a lot of different types of soldiers so. you know we i always laugh because it's like we want to believe oh my gosh it was the military they you know if it was a, a former military or or something those are much more believable stories to us and and then i kind of laugh and i'm like it's funny that my listeners and followers will say that yet in the next breath, they can't believe anything the military shares because yeah, right, military right. lies to us. Um, no, but no doubt there is, there's something about, you know, when law enforcement or the military is involved, I think people just tend to believe it because I think there's more at stake, you know, professionally mm -hmm. or even just life or life or death. You can't play around too much. You know, when people are, have live bullets and are pointing guns at you, um, so, you know, I think that element of it makes it a little bit more legitimate to a lot of people. For those of you watching along, I did put a link in tonight's uh, live chat. So if you click that link, it'll give you more information about the upcoming event at the Gettysburg 
Battlefield Bash, and it's a lot of fun. Come on out, be a part of it. Uh, again, all the information and ticket information is at darknessevents.com, or you can click on the link that I just provided in the live chat. Um, we've not got a whole lot of time left. I'm just curious, as you started putting this book together, did any paranormal activity get stirred up in your own personal life? <laughs> well, I was writing the book. Now, unfortunately, yeah. I can't say it did. <laughs> Oh man, come on! It would make it so much a better story. It in would, it? If I could make something <laughs> up. <laughs> Were there any stories that you elected not to put in this book that you kind of wish you would have now that you've got it out and printed? With any of those kind of like last minute remorseful uh, releases from the book? Um, honestly, I no. I, I used pretty much all the ones that I thought were the most interesting. Kind of filtered through mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that you know wasn't as reliable. Cause that's one of the things too. I, I really looked for stuff that was provable to some extent mm -hmm. that that unit was definitely at that location. Um, you know, the, the guy's willing to give his name, you know, just things like that, that add that little bit more legitimacy to it. Um, definitely tried to find that. Uh, but that's what I'm looking for. Send me your, your stories and we'll get that second book put out. <laughs> Joe Crafted says, military members are truthful, but the military, I don't know. Yeah, it's go. an interesting, <laughs> interesting point about that. Uh, Ray, Ray Lancashire asks, are there any stories of the Black Eyed Kid phenomena that you're familiar with? I don't have with? any in this book. Okay. That sounds like something to investigate further for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, crazy stories. And, and if you get some of these guys, my biggest problem was I would get stories from these guys that they asked me. I will tell you, please do not. You know, you could share it. To a degree, I can't let you tell people directly where it was. You can just say when I served in Afghanistan or when I served in Iraq and not give any specifics because there's still things that are going on there. Right. Um, and I was like, okay, no problem. And some of them would just give me the details. And, and again, so matter of fact, and then that was like they needed to purge it. And now they wanted to just not talk about it again. Right. Uh, many of them, you know all of them wish to remain anonymous. So if there are any military, former military or active military that are listening to the show now that have had encounters with any strange beings while you're serving in the military, email me, Dave at paranormal60.com. We'll share it on the show. We'll share it with RC Bramall. It might end up in a second book. You never know. You okay. never know. All right. With about two, three minutes left to go, give one of your favorite all time ghost stories from the book or experiences that, uh, to tantalize the listeners and viewers with before we head off? Um, just a really neat one. Another uh, observation point, observation post, Salerno, um, also in Afghanistan. Uh, this base overlooked an old Afghan cemetery, and it seems that a young girl likes to haunt the soldiers there. Um, numerous encounters that were pretty creepy. Where the you know like the, the guys would be in this watchtower, and they'd hear kind of like little footsteps over the trap door. Um, they'd hear a child giggling over their radio. The other tower would call over and say that they saw like a little three foot tall individual moving around the base of the tower. And they'd go out and look. No one would be there. Um, several different soldiers, different reports of this same entity. Um, a couple female soldiers walking between different locations on the base heard footsteps, something following them, kept turning around, wouldn't see anything. Their friend watching from the guard clearly saw a little girl behind them, but just like you were talking about, was afraid to kind of report it and, you know, didn't want to get labeled a lunatic and kind of waited till he was out of there before he even told the, those two women what he had seen and scared the hell out of them. Haunted War Tales, True Military Encounters with the Bizarre, Paranormal, and Unexplained. That's the book. It'll be out in April, but pre-order it now so that you're among the first to get those copies as soon as they come off the press. You can order it through the link that we have on tonight's show. RC, I'm curious uh, if you believe that any of the ghostly activity and things that maybe were heard and not seen might have to do more with alien intervention since aliens do seem to have such a, a predilection and an interest in our military uh would you be surprised to find out that those little pitter patters of feet might have actually been from a gray or something else that was there watching them hey no doubt something's going on right seems like ever since we uh 
blew that atom bomb. They've been watching us and they've been visiting. Could I ask a question? And if you don't want to, if you don't want to answer, this is totally fine. But I'm curious, as somebody who had a position with the military in intelligence, we hear all of these people coming forward now whistleblowing, sharing stories, sharing information. Is there a certain statute of limitations on the knowledge that you gain when you work in the intelligence industry? Like, you know, I left, it's seven years later, now I can talk about it? Or because in a sense, it feels like if it's a former intelligence agent sharing this information, isn't that a kind of a form of treason if you're giving up information and secrets that you had to have a top level clearance to get to begin with? Yeah, it totally depends on what you're talking about, whether it's been declassified or not. That's really the, you know, the kind of a, a indicator there, of whether you're going to get you, in trouble or not. When you were looking uh, and working in the field, um, would there be cases, and you don't have to give specifics or anything like that, but would you say that there were things that came across your desk or, or your department that fit the supernatural realm? Oh, definitely. Definitely a couple. How did the higher ups deal with that? Was it just something like, okay, we know about it. Let's move on. Or was it something that left them perplexed and worried as well? It seems to be more of that kind of case most of the time. It's, it's an anomaly. Let it go. Carry on with your mission. Very strange. Very <laughs> strange. Well, R.C. Bramhall, our guest, uh, it was a pleasure talking with you, sir. Thank you so much for serving. Hey, and thank for what you so continue much. continue to do to educate people and enlighten and share. The book is called Haunted War Tales, True Military Encounters with the Bizarre, Paranormal, Unexplained. Get the link on today's program guide and make sure that you pick up the book follow it, read it, and then make sure that you also go out there and rate and review the book after you purchase it. Well, that's it for this evening's program. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. And may the darkness of the world be just a little more light with the information that we share here. So that those of you that may have served in our military or worked around military bases that believe that they experienced things and thought themselves to be crazy, I hope that you see a glimmer of light that you're not, that there are strange and unexplained things that take place around us at all times. And just because it's not something that goes by the books doesn't mean that it isn't a very real experience. So if you're still in doubt or you're feeling depressed or anxious, anxiety ridden about having had these experiences, please realize you are not alone in this. And please seek help. Don't make any rash decisions. Uh, that are long-term decisions that, uh, you know, are for temporary circumstances. Please be cautious, be careful, and thank you all to all of the military personnel around the United States and around the world that continue to serve on our behalf. On behalf of the Paranormal 60 and all of our crew, thank you very much. Have a great and pleasant night. We'll see you again Wednesday when I'm joined by Neil Story and we look into the spooky UK right here on the Paranormal 60. Paranormal 60.